Okay, hello. Thank you uh, for having me here today. My name is Lauren Walliser, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Center for Law and Social Policy, which is also known as CLASP. Uh, CLASP is a nonpartisan nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. We work for policy change that advances racial equity and alleviates poverty. And so in my work, I focus on ways to make higher education more affordable and accessible for students of color and students uh, with low incomes who come from low income families. And so an important part of that work is working on ability to benefit to make sure students who haven't been, who've been underserved in the high school and sometimes college context get access to financial resources to help them pay for college. And so CLASP has an entire page on our website dedicated to ATB. And so if you want to read more about it after the presentation today, you can find it at clasp.org forward slash resources dash ability dash benefit. So a little bit more about ability to benefit. I know Angela went through a lot, um, but just kind of to remind you, because it's been a little bit since you heard it, um, the Higher Education Act, or HEA, allows students to get federal financial aid to help them pay for their college coursework. Um, this can help them pay for their tuition expenses, their books, or some living expenses while they're enrolled in those courses. And in order to be eligible, students have to either have completed high school, gotten a GED, or some other type of equivalent diploma. ATB, however, is a special rule in the HEA that says students don't need that high school diploma or other credential, just so long as they meet the special set of requirements. And as Angela mentioned, those requirements are they have to be enrolled in a career pathway program, and they have to either pass an exam, complete six credits, or complete the state-defined process. So the reason why a student has to be enrolled in a career pathway program is that career pathways are designed to provide students with this contextualized education experience where adult education and post-secondary education are offered together, um, preparing them for um, some sort of career or career field. They also put graduates into career fields that are in demand in their local or regional area. And so this is really for the students benefit to complete their program faster and help set them up well for economic success and economic security. Now, the reason the students have to do one of these three, three things here, uh, the exam, the six credits or the state process is really because Congress wanted students to be able to demonstrate that they're ready for the college work that they're enrolling in. So for instance, take Pell Grants. Pell Grants have a lifetime limit. And so we don't want students drawing down against that limit, which they may need in future college you know, endeavors that they take on. Um, we don't want them drawing that down today if they may need it in the future. And they're clearly not academically prepared or at a place to succeed in college today. So they really came approached these three rules as like, what are the potential metrics for evaluating if a student's prepared for college? What does college ready look like? And so what they came up with were these three options that sort of range from a proxy measure, which is the exam, uh, to a direct demonstration of an ability to succeed, which is the college credits. And they also came up with this opportunity, the third one. And it's an opportunity to show that some other way may be better that they didn't think of. And that's the state process. So in the slides that are to follow, I'm going to discuss the pros and cons of each of these three methods. And then we'll go into a deeper discussion about the state process method specifically afterward. So the first one is passing an exam. Um, if a student is able to pass an exam, they can receive financial aid through ATB. This has some advantages to the college because administering these exams may be a common experience or the college may already have um, the staff and the capability to administer the exam easily. For the student, it may not be very time consuming. For instance, it doesn't take weeks or months in order to achieve this. Um, it, you know, it could take a day or two just to complete the exam. And it's relatively low cost or no cost for them. Um, however, there are disadvantages to relying on the exam as a way to get students aid through ATB. Uh, for instance, many common exams that students may be given to assess their skills aren't on the ATB list approved by the U.S. Department of Education. And so Angela referenced this. Um, TABE, for instance, isn't on the list. The actual list is very short. It just has 
the Wonder Lake Basic Skills in English and Spanish language. Um, it has AccuPlacer and it has the combined English language skills assessment exam. Those are the only ones on the list. Um, in addition, students may be asked to take the exam that day or in the very near future, which doesn't give them adequate time to prepare or to refresh some skills that maybe they haven't used in a number of years if they've been away from school for a long period of time. The student may just have test anxiety related to any exam and that may not be any different for this one and may not do well because of that. And um, we've heard a lot of our partner colleges tell us is that if they think there's a chance the student could pass one of the tests on the approved list, then they just give them the GED directly because passing the GED allows the student to enroll right in college without having to co-enroll in adult education. It doesn't require them to do the special rules for ATB. They can just go right into becoming a college student. Um, finally, there's a COVID-19 specific concern that I've also heard, um, and that's if students have to take these tests in person because either there's rules about the test or they don't have the technology or the Wi-Fi where they're living. Um, and this in-person requirement may not be possible, obviously, given our socially distanced conditions. Another option students have is to complete six credits or its equivalent, which is 225 clock hours. So the advantage to using this method is that it allows them to simultaneously make progress on their academic program while meeting the standards for ATB. Um, it actually is a, arguably kind of the most direct and effective way of showing whether a student can complete college if they're actually succeeding in a college level course, clearly then they do have the potential to do well and they should be able to access aid through ability to benefit. However, because students aren't eligible for federal financial aid until they complete those six credits, they have to find some way to pay for those six credits. And so we've heard, um, you know, many colleges and that we've worked with have come up with many different creative ways for finding resources because a lot of times students don't have that money themselves. Um, we've heard some colleges um, using money from a private foundation to pay for it or they're using resources from their college foundation. Some use we owe a title one dollars, like a, if a student has an ITA. We've heard some colleges subsidizing part of the cost, like making those credits a reduced cost option. Um, but these options sometimes require work and coordination, and financial resources aren't always readily available for the purpose of um, helping students pay for those six courses. And the final option for students to be eligible for ATB is to complete something. It can be an exam, it can be a set of tasks, however it's defined by the state that's outlined in a state-defined process. And so this flexibility in the design of it is one of the advantages to this option. A state could choose to make students eligible in any of a variety of ways. <clears throat> so for instance, a state may want to think about how to align the state-defined process with their other priorities, with their educational goals or their statewide goals, with college or employer needs, with their population characteristics, or initiatives like ICAPS, IET. It could be designed in a way where the college and or the student doesn't have to pay anything up front, like there's no testing fee or no course tuition. Um, and oversight is done at the state level. So if you're a college or someone working directly with students and you have challenges or questions, you can interact with ICCB rather than having to go to the US Department of Education to get your questions answered. And the more localized control model that this has also helps with coordination among state partners and colleges at the state level. So the only challenge, and admittedly this is a big challenge, is that the state option doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist yet. Um, the lack of a process is not unique to Illinois. A state process is allowed under the Higher Education Act, but many, many, many states have failed to engage in the steps to develop one. So you can see here that in very recent developments, um, Wisconsin and Washington both have had state-defined process approved. They're the first and only states in the United States to have one. The method to create the state-defined process is really however you wish it to be. Um, but just for illustrative purposes, um, I'm thinking about what I've heard Wisconsin and Washington do and other states that CLASP has worked with who have begun to pursue this. I have some ways that it, th this process could look like. 
So ICCB would lead the process of developing the plan ideally engages stakeholders. Um, this is done in forums like we hope to do with you all in a minute here and in other places. One state we talked to um, engaged all of their community colleges in a collective listening session and then again met with them after drafting the plan um, to give them a final review before submitting it to the U.S. Department of Education. They also engaged partners in different specialties that included adult education, financial aid administrators, career and technical education, and workforce development because they all have roles to play in ability to benefit. Uh, you may also want to consider engaging students or potential students to hear their opinions about it. So after input is received, ICCB would draft a plan and send it to the U.S. Secretary of Education. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education has six months to approve. Now, both Wisconsin and Washington went through a process similar to this, submitted their plans, waited their six months, and then they got rejected. So you do need to be prepared that rejection is a possibility. Um, in both cases, the U.S. Department of Education included with the rejection letter recommendations for how they could make the plan stronger. Uh, and in both cases, Wisconsin and Washington made those changes and resubmitted and were accepted on the second try. Similarly, we know that Iowa has submitted a, a plan. Um, it got rejected on the first attempt, but they also plan to resubmit and you know, make those edits that the department recommended. So although very few states have submitted a plan, and although every state that has submitted one has been rejected the first time, uh, it, actually the U.S. Department of Education is very supportive of ATB and expanding its use. Members of both political parties in Congress and the Trump administration have all sought opportunities to promote the good work that's happening in ATB and that colleges are doing to innovate around it and looking for ways to make it more commonly utilized. So I mentioned this to highlight that this is a rare issue with bipartisan engagement. And so it means you have a greater possibility for success in this space than you may in other areas of your work. So to give you a sense of what Illinois' plan could do, um, using examples from the ones that are approved, Wisconsin uses multiple measures. The plan they submitted to the U.S. Department of Education says that colleges can look at, quote, multiple forms of cognitive assessment, such as the AccuPlacer, GED tests, GED predictor tests, and other qualifying assessment measures. In addition, they say that colleges can consider career interests and non-cognitive factors to develop what they call a comprehensive student assessment profile. So it's really like a portfolio method, allowing them to evaluate student achievements, skills, and interests. And their guidance to colleges has not yet been developed, but they may have more specific information um, contained in that. And then Washington, they allow students to be eligible for ATB if they co-enroll in a college level program through IBEST and enroll in the state's high school 21 plus program. So IBEST uses ABE4 ESL5 as a baseline for students' abilities and the high school 21 plus program allows students to earn high school credit and it allows them to earn a high school diploma and not a GED or some kind of equivalency. It's also a more affordable option for students than the GED program. Uh, both Washington and Wisconsin actually have longstanding policies that allow someone to earn post-secondary credits that then apply back to the completion of high school. This allows the students to earn a high school credential by completing a certain level of coursework in college. Um, there are other requirements to the state-defined process that are more technical or require less community input. Um, these include asking how the monitoring agency, in this case it would be ICCB, will make sure colleges are following the process and how they would sanction those who are not. It also asks for a list of institutions who would participate and like this would, that this plan would apply to, and that typically includes all of the community colleges in the state. Um, and there are a few others. I wrote a paper discussing each of these requirements um, and putting them in plain English because the original requirements are written in a kind of a U.S. Department of Education regulation language. Um, and that paper is included as a material um, on, for our session on the Whova app. You can see it there. Um, but you can also feel free to reach out directly to me and I'm happy to send it to you. 
So finally, just to give you all a chance to ask me questions before we move on to our discussion about the state defined process. Um, are there any questions you had about that process or any of the other options for students that I discussed. <laughs> 